And now we are moving to the questions and answer sessions. We already acquired many questions from the participants and I will try to read this to each of the lecturers. So for Dr. Gurbilas, there is a question from Muskan uh, from India. My question is that why smell in COVID-19 patients return only after at least of three months? I think it is more of a regeneration of the neurons there. Um, um, I don't see any other reason for that. The damage is done to any neuron in the body. It takes some regeneration and probably that's the sort of time it needs for the same. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Gurbilas. And then we move to the second questions by Muhammad Sayat Boska from Bangladesh. For an admitted patients with mild to moderate sy symptoms with RT-PCR for COVID-19 positive, should we routinely do CT chest or D-dimer along with other general routine tests? Uh, yeah, 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 Dr. Gurbilash. No, no, that's that's for you, I think. You can go ahead, thank you. Hi, I thank you, Dr. Gurbilash. Uh, I, uh, I will also uh, like to add for the first question, uh, I agree with uh, Dr. Gurbilash that uh, uh, it takes time uh, for uh, the neuron to uh, be back in the uh, normal state prior to infection. Uh, uh, we can see in, uh, even uh, in stroke patients, cerebrovascular disease patients, uh, it takes time about uh, three to six months. Uh, that's the golden period for the patient to get back normal to, for the neuron to regenerate and any other thing. So I agree with uh, Dr. Gurbilash. And for the second question, uh, it will be much better. It will be much better if you can do a routine chest x-ray, especially for hospitalized patient. What we're doing over here is for a hospitalized patient that is a moderate patient, a moderate symptoms and also severe uh, and in critical, it will be, of course, we've been doing a CT uh, scan and the dimer. Uh, not only we can uh, uh, do, uh, evaluate the prognostic of the patients, because uh, we never know uh, this COVID-19 patients, uh, when will they develop uh, this progression from the moderate symptoms to severe to critical? It's uh, not that uh, clearly shown, uh, but we can uh, use some prognostic, uh, which I showed that, uh, yeah, chest CT you can do and also a uh, uh, D-dimer test, uh, probably uh, to antigulate the patient. Thank you. Okay, thank um, you uh, um, maybe some uh, advice from Dr. Gurbilash. Um, I would say a CT is a very good test. A high resolution CT is a very good test to risk stratify as well. D dimers, uh, they can be non specific, but anybody with the significant symptoms must undergo a CT chest, as we discussed in the talks. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Gurbelas and Dr. Gurmet. Uh, and this is a question for Dr. Gurbelas from Kevin in Indonesia. How long can COVID 19 virus survive on the surface of an object? So uh, to that, we can say various surfaces will have, uh, you know, different uh, times for the virus to survive. I think initially it was mentioned uh, metallic services will have them have the virus for several days uh, and something like a fabric would have it for a few hours. So various surfaces, uh, various time periods for the virus. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Gurbilas. And that is the first three questions for Dr. Gurbez, and we move to the first three questions for Dr. Gurbez. This is from the Mohamed Said Boska, but um, unfortunately this will be answered in the tomorrow sessions because we have another session for the vaccine development by Dr. Santos. And the second question is by Ashi Khanna in India. Many people believe that drinking hot water and taking steam may prevent you from COVID-19. Can taking regular steam and drinking hot water really prevent the people from the COVID-19? Oh, yeah, okay. Uh, thank you. This is a good question. So uh, in the early stage of this uh, pandemic, uh, I've been also seeing uh, like videos, reading some articles about uh, drinking hot water and taking steam may prevent you from COVID-19. Uh, so uh, right now there is no uh, ongoing trials about this uh, taking steam, but there is a paper uh, also I shared in my uh, PowerPoint that uh, Fever is good. Actually, fever is good uh, for COVID-19 patients. Yeah, also for viral uh, any other viral patients uh, up to 39 degrees. So, uh, and there is also a paper, uh, an old paper about uh, taking hot and cold showers. So, what they found out over there is uh, while heating up the patient, like in sauna, 
uh, uh, up to 39 or 40 degrees, uh, it can enhance your innate immune system. And after that, uh, uh, taking a cold shower will further enhance uh, your immune system. So uh, 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 looking at results from those papers, uh, in my personal opinion, yeah, uh, it's good uh, to take like a hot water and taking steam. Not, uh, it, it might not prevent 100% uh, uh, someone from getting COVID-19 patient, but it might reduce the chance of uh, someone of getting a COVID-19 patient. Even uh, me, myself, I've been drinking uh, hot water and also taking these uh, cold showers, eh, hot and cold showers regularly. Uh, on, a lighter, on a lighter note, if I may add in, I've had a couple of patients who have had deep burns on their legs while taking steam, they accidentally dropped hot water. So one uh, has yeah. to be very careful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree with you, Dr. Gurbilash. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Gurbilash and Dr. Gurbilash. We move to the second question. I think this is more for Dr. Gurbilash for the diagnosis. It's, uh, is it possible for coronavirus to pass through the placenta from T. Tikyang to Malaysia? So what we are talking here is a vertical transmission of coronavirus. Um, to the best of my memory and knowledge, I think there was a study from Italy, uh, a, a small one, in which they saw that uh, there can be vertical transmission of coronavirus. Uh, I don't remember the details of the study, but uh, I do remember that uh, a small number of uh, mothers transmitted the virus to the uh, newborn. So yes, it is possible. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Gurbilas. So we move to the next questions from Tanis from India. What's your opinion on the interim results of the solar derivative trial by WHO, which has rejected hydroxychloroquine, lopinavir, ritonavir, and the interferon? Uh, Dr. Gurbilas? Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, Indonesia uh, is also one of the country included in this uh, solidarity trial. Uh, probably, uh, I think India must uh, have been included also. So the result was uh, they rejected uh, hydroxychloroquine uh, earlier enough uh, in the study. So we've been recruiting, uh, uh, let's say, five group of patients, uh, standard care, hydroxychloroquine, uh, lopinavir, ritonavir, interferon, and one uh, one other, I forgot, uh, one other group. So they stopped this uh, hydroxychloroquine uh, group uh, or treating patient with hydroxychloroquine uh, uh, even before uh, they did an interim results, uh, probably from uh, outside results also suggest that there is no benefit uh, hydroxychloroquine, lopinavir, ritonavir, uh, interferon. But uh, looking from some results, uh, uh, they've been showing like uh, probably some combination, uh, uh, combination therapy in South Korea, uh, with lopinavir, ritonavir, uh, and with uh, interferon, they, they, they have been giving some uh, positive results. Uh, uh, even though in solidarity trial, uh, they give like uh, separate uh, antiviral treatments, uh, but probably uh, combination therapy, uh, they have been giving some uh, positive results. As well, uh, for hydroxychloroquine, uh, 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 I've been giving to my patients, uh, has, a, what do you say, a zinc ionophore. So whenever I give zinc to my patient, I will add uh, hydroxychloroquine because I shared that hydroxychloroquine uh, uh, is one of the best uh, or uh, for zinc ionophore. It can enhance uh, the uptake of zinc uh, into the cells. Uh, that's it from me. Uh, probably uh, about uh, hydroxychloroquine prophylaxis. Uh, I'm not so sure about that, but uh, I think also uh, uh, they don't give a positive uh, point for hydroxychloroquine uh, Prophylaxis. Probably Dr. Gurbilash has uh, much more experience about this hydroxychloroquine prophylaxis in India. And saying that uh, I have not taken it myself, many of my colleagues did. Um, I think uh, now is the time when most of them are forgetting taking it also. So they don't remember when they last took it, whether it was two weeks ago or one week ago. So what I'm trying to say here is, I think we have learned to live with it now um, yeah. and we are being more careful. You know, initially it was a big knee-jerk reaction that everybody must take uh, prophylaxis with hydroxychloroquine. And then there were some mixed responses about it. We were not sure what's happening. I think we have not seen such a situation in the world for the last many years, uh, in our lifetimes at least, where we are not sure of what to do. This is an evolving thing. Nobody's sure. Maybe 10 years hence, we would be much wiser as to what should have been done, as is with most diseases. 
Uh, right now, uh, I would simply say many of my colleagues have stopped taking hydroxychloroquine prophylaxis and uh, solidarity trial, uh, you know, uh, the drugs have not been uh, shown to be much effective, but uh, as you've already mentioned much of it, so I would just add that much. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Gurbit and Dr. Gurbilas. Moving to the next questions from Muhammad Sayyid Boska. Uh, WHO said that... So, uh, let me just answer the second question uh, about remdesivir. Yes. Uh, remdesivir, should, should we use this drug for treating severe or critical uh, COVID-19 patient? Uh, uh, I shared one uh, study that the recovery uh, study over there. So what they found out is uh, there's no benefit uh, in giving uh, remdesivir in patient uh, other than uh, the need for low dose oxygen therapy. So patient in severe, they need this high flow nasal oxygen therapy, patient critical, they are intubated. Uh, there's no addi uh, additional benefits uh, uh, from those uh, from that trial, but it comes back again to our national guidelines. Uh, and for the third question, significant side effects. Uh, well, uh, for uh, the side effects one is uh, uh, liver enzymes. Uh, you, a patient can get uh, elevated liver enzymes, uh, hyperuricemia. And there is also one uh, issue that has to be discussed uh, with the patient, uh, a female COVID-19 patient, uh, which will be taking this Pafipiravir. Uh, we have to test a pregnancy test uh, just to make sure uh, that the patient is not pregnant, has Pafipiravir, have some teratogenic effects. And also in male patients, uh, there is uh, some effects of reducing the uh, I'm uh, sorry, the sperms uh, in the male patient. So this is one of the issue also to, dis uh, to be discussed with the patient. And uh, probably uh, we should also inform the patient uh, of not uh, to do any intercourse uh, as we know that uh, it can be secreted in the uh, sperms. And for tocilizumab, uh, we have to make sure that, yeah, it is a uh, cytokine storm going on. Tocilizumab uh, inter IL-6 is uh, high. Uh, and one of the side effects is uh, it will suppress your immune systems. Uh, it can activate uh, secondary bacterial infections, uh, activate also some tuberculosis infection. So we have to make sure that the patient is, uh, doesn't have uh, or is negative for any bacterial infection. Uh, and it will, it will be quite difficult. So uh, in our institution, we usually have a COVID board meeting uh, to discuss whether or not to give this uh, anti-ILL IL-6 in this patient. For remdesivir, mm, there is a slight increase uh, in the uh, kidney function test. So I think we have to evaluate kidney function test before giving this uh, remdesivir. That's all from my side. Okay, thank you, <coughs> Dr. Gurmet. And we're moving to the next panel of questions for Dr. Gurbilas. Uh, Kartik from India, can allergic rhinitis from symptoms like sneezing, redness, and irritation of eye and nasal discharge superimposed on the COVID-19 symptoms? Uh, since we've already said that we should not assume things, and if there is any concern, uh, best is to get tested. Now, um, you know, redness of eye, sneezing, as well as a nasal discharge, they are not the common symptoms, but if there is fever with it, and if there are any other signs that suggest it could be COVID. And if a clinician, uh, I wouldn't put this power in the hand of a, um, you know, a patient. If a clinician feels it's appropriate, it should be done. I, as a clinician, uh, in, I'm in a favor of uh, doing more tests, as many as possible, um, to reach out and to confirm how many cases we are actually seeing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Berbilas. And can you please brief us about the CRISPR test, uh, the Peluda test? Um, I think CRISPR test is one of the very latest ones, which is uh, very, very quick, I think. But it, I'm not sure whether it's validated or not. Um, uh, Dr. Gurmeet Singh, do you know anything about this? Yeah, yeah. I, I've just uh, read a little bit about this CRISPR test. So usually this is... a. I should say a DNA sequence uh, usually been used for a bacterial infection, but there are some uh, studies going on. I, I've not gone through uh, uh, the majority of the studies that uh, it might uh, give some benefits uh, 
for antiviral also. But uh, like it play a key role in the antiviral uh, defense system. Uh, but I, I have not gone through uh, uh, deep enough in this uh, paper, Dr. Gurvilash. Yeah, uh, frankly, I don't think it's validated as of, as of now. It may be one of the tests which comes, you know, I think what I remember of this is that it takes very little time to come back as a result. And it's uh, very, very clear and, uh, um, you know, confirms. But um, I don't know about the validation yet. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Gurbilas and Dr. Gumit. And we move to the questions from Muhammad Said Boska from Bangladesh. As SARS-CoV-2 can be found in stool sample, can, so can we say that this virus is also transmitted by orofacal orof route? Uh, certainly, there was uh, one instance from Wuhan where a flat was uh, sealed, affected individuals' flat was sealed, and then later on when they took samples, uh, you know, uh, in the toilets, uh, the, it was full of uh, the virus. Now, fecal oral root, how significant is that? That is very significant, of course. But if we wash our hands, we break the chain. So uh, certainly we, have, we know it's in the stool. Fecal oral root may be able to you know, spread the virus. That is why the three W's that we talk about, washing hands is very important. And uh, as in any other virus, uh, you know, hepatitis A, hepatitis E, uh, you know, we can easily break the chain of fecal oral root by simply keeping our hands clean. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Dr. Gurbilas. And we move to the next question panel from Mashikarna in India. What could be the possible opportunistic infections in COVID-19 patients for Dr. Gurbilas? Hi, okay. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, uh, I haven't gone through uh, any paper about the possible opportunistic infection, uh, but what I've been seeing in, in our uh, patient, critical COVID-19 patient here in uh, my institution, that once they are intubated, uh, I've been performing uh, bronchoscopy procedures in these patients. So I found like secondary bacterial infection, uh, usually uh, Acinobacter bomani, uh, we got a pseudomonas infection, uh, that uh, possibly uh, secondary infection, whereas uh, opportunistic infection, uh, uh, like I mentioned before, probably uh, could be due to uh, NTEL6 uh, therapy in this kind of patient, but uh, I've not been seeing any uh, opportunistic infection in COVID-19 patients uh, uh, yet now. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we next move to the next question. Is it possible for coronavirus recurrence if it can do a recurrence? Is the, is the clinical and prognosis getting worse? And what is the difference? Oh, sorry, uh, yeah, yes, could we go ahead, please? Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Gurbilas. Uh, so it's possible uh, to get a reinfection uh, of coronavirus. There have been uh, some case reports. So usually uh, a person might be reinfected uh, probably in the range of two to three months uh, after the previous uh, infection, but also uh, it depends uh, on the uh, antibody levels and the uh, state of the COVID-19 patient. Uh, if he or she uh, in, uh, develops mild to moderate COVID-19 patient, probably the uh, antibody level is not that high uh, compared to a severe or critical COVID-19 patient. And uh, is the prognosis getting worse? Whereas the, uh, there's uh, one also issue that we have to um, make it clear, whether is it a reinfection or like uh, we have a case over here uh, in my institution, we are just uh, discussing also, whether is it a case of, of post-inflammatory, uh, post-infection inflammatory syndrome. So we have got a case over here, a uh, patient female uh, developed COVID-19 in the month of uh, September, 29 September, uh, uh, positive for RT-PCR. So uh, she was totally fine and she came back again uh, with uh, severe COVID-19 and develop progress into uh, critical COVID-19, we have to intubate the patient. Uh, swab test from the uh, nasopharyngeal swab was uh, negative. Uh, and uh, uh, I performed the bronchoscopy yesterday only. So we got the result and it came out to be positive. Uh, but uh, there's an issue like uh, last month, she was uh, positive for COVID-19, swab test is uh, negative. Usually uh, I read a paper that uh, COVID-19 uh, 
SARS-CoV uh, dies uh, after eight or to 10 days uh, since symptom onset. So probably this might uh, be due to uh, post-infection inflammatory syndrome, but uh, I think we have to uh, uh, further discuss uh, this matter. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Gourmet. And I would like to move to the next question. Uh, what could be the possible ways and treatments with less side effects for the cytokine storm in the COVID-19 patients, Dr. Gourmet? Uh, for the cytokine storm, uh, we have to make sure whether is it a cytokine storm or is it just hypercytokinemia. Uh, in mild to moderate, uh, whether it's bacterial infection, it's viral infection, you have a, a, a elevated IL-6 uh, level in your blood, uh, probably this is a hypercytokinemia. Yeah? And if you have a high uh, IL-6 level uh, in a critical ill, uh, in a severe, or in a critical ill COVID-19 patients, uh, that's probably due to cytokine storm uh, going on in that patient. So uh, light side effects uh, uh, probably uh, might be because of the uh, medication that we're gonna give. Uh, over here, we have been using uh, tocilizumab therapy in the, uh, those kind of patients. Uh, we have to make sure there is no secondary bacterial infection or if there is secondary bacterial infection, usually uh, patient in critical ill, so they already develop uh, pneumonia. So we give uh, antibiotics to the patient. Probably we have to make sure no fungal infection. And the third one is, uh, like I mentioned before in the further question, uh, probably opportunistic infection like tuberculosis uh, have to be evaluated, that's all. Okay, thank you very much. And for the second question, I think we already answered that in the Dr. Gurmet lectures about the treatment protocol and the criterion for hospital admissions. So we move to the third question for Dr. Gurbilas. This is there, there is a development device that detects a violet organic compounds as a result of SARS-CoV-2 infections in breath. So people just need to breathe in order to diagnose COVID-19. What do you think about the breath test like that? Well, I, I think the sensitivity will be pretty low here, um, and uh, it would require validation anyway. Um, you know, if, if we were catching a lot of uh, virus in the breath itself, it would be very dangerous, um, and the spread would be much more. So I would, I would say um, such a test may carry a very low sensitivity, uh, although it may sound very easy to do, just like an alcohol breath test that the police do for, you know, offenders. Uh, this may be something... Um, very easy to do, but uh, I would uh, be very skeptic about such a test. What, what do you think, uh, Dr. Gurmeet Singh? Yeah, I agree with you, Dr. Gurubila. So uh, uh, they're developing, like uh, they said, this uh, breath test, but uh, it's quite uh, like uh, dangerous also to perform this breath test, like Dr. Gurubila already uh, mentioned before. If he or she is positive for COVID-19 and uh, doing this breath test, uh, mild uh, spread out this virus uh, in further. Thank you. Okay. okay, thank you very much, Dr. Gurmit and Dr. Gurbilas for the answer. And we are moving to the next question from KM Tijas, India. Why do doctors suggest patients to have vitamin C and zinc supplements when they are in home isolation? Dr. Gurmit, please. Yeah, uh, about vitamin C, uh, I've been reading some articles. Uh, vitamin C, high dose vitamin C is uh, beneficial in uh, septic patient, in soft sepsis, uh, septic patient. But uh, I haven't found any articles about uh, vitamin C supplements uh, in COVID-19 patients. Uh, as uh, for zinc supplements, uh, like I mentioned before, yeah, zinc has a role in uh, COVID-19. Uh, also zinc uh, plays a role in uh, cellular immunity. Uh, zinc together with, uh, zinc supplements together with zinc ionophore uh, gives a positive results uh, in COVID-19 patient. And uh, I prescribe zinc supplements and zinc ionophore uh, to my COVID-19 patient. Okay, is there any opinion from Dr. Gribelas? I think uh, uh, vitamin C and zinc both are known to have uh, been good for uh, a person's immunity. And uh, that is reason enough to use it. Vitamin C also prevents common cold so so that there is no overlap and so that otherwise we are hale and hearty and healthy. Uh, I myself would say this, that, you know, I have never worn masks before, uh, maybe except in the hospitals and in the operation theaters, yes, but outside we have never worn masks before. And uh, I personally have felt that uh, 
you know, going out now, I don't get the normal uh, rhinorrhea, my normal allergies that I used to have regularly. So I feel much better. Um, there are certain things like vitamin C, which have been validated and which are well known to, you know, avoid common colds and treat common colds rather than, you know, use of antibiotics, which is rampant in a country like India. So uh, in my practice, I've been using vitamin C for a long time. Um, and it, it does have good results. Um, also with anemic patients and other things, you know, vitamin C is a good drug anyway. It's just a supplement really. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Dr. And also, uh, Jeremy, uh, sorry. Uh, and also I would like uh, to add also uh, vitamin C supplementation is also beneficial when patients are in home isolation or uh, patient uh, in hospitalized for COVID-19. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Gubles and Dr. Gumet. We move to the next patient. Patient with mild symptoms, but newly detected sudden hypoxia or happy hypoxia. Should we admit the patients to the hospital right away, Dr. Gubles? So, um, well, mild symptoms, uh, it just depends on what uh, a clinician feels about it and how the uh, you know patient is. Like if I may say my patient, Mr. B, uh, he did not have uh, any significant symptoms, but ultimately we had to admit him to the hospital because of various reasons. So it, it wasn't because of his uh, COVID status being negative or positive or his saturations, which were like 93. He wasn't really short of breath, but he had several other symptoms, which may be because of anxiety. Um, you know, if a patient lands up in the hospital emergency for any reason and, uh, you know, um, although the saturations may be borderline, say just 93, 94, and he is a little short of breath, which may be subjective because his respiratory rate otherwise is not uh, really uh, labored. Um, you know, it just depends on a clinical scenario. Uh, there are set protocols which we follow, but this is a case to case thing and a clinician to clinician thing, uh, depending on the resources as well. You know, in a country like India, where a patient is in control and wants to be admitted um, you know, it comes to that. But when the bed strength goes down, when we don't have beds, then we have to case stratify in a slightly different way. So I, I would say there are set protocols. We follow them all the time. But the most important thing is what the clinician feels about a particular patient. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I think this is the end of the question and answer sessions. We are apologize for every question that left unanswered. I will come with an answer soon if that is possible. And we would like to thank you, Dr. Gurbilas and Dr. Gurmet for sharing such important and useful information for this webinar. And I would like to present the certificates electronically in this presentations to Dr. Gurbilas and Dr. Gurmet. And this is the certificate for the Dr. Gurbilas. And I will take a screenshot uh, with Dr. Gurbilas and the certificate. Uh, in one, two, and three. Okay, and then we move to thank the you. Dr. Gourmet. Uh, thank you, Dr. Gourmet, for your presentations, and we will take the picture with the certificates in one, two, and three. Okay, this is this marks the end of the day one of the Web AMSA International Webinar Series for an approach towards COVID-19. I hope we all get the useful informations and beneficial informations towards the management and diagnosis of the COVID-19. I would like to recap the info information from the two lectures in one resume. There is no assumptions in the diagnosis towards COVID-19, which is we can see the most common symptoms is the fever, dry cough, and tiredness. And there, there is less common symptoms, but we must be also aware about it. And hypertension, obesity, and diabetes is the most factor com contributing to the severity of the COVID-19 with the elderly is more at risk of the COVID-19. And we can see from the presentation that RT-PCR, RT-LAM, and antigen assay is the most common methods and the most sensitive and specific methods used for the diagnosis of COVID-19, which we also can use the CT scan, but not preferably X-ray. Tracing and surveillance is very important to make sure that everyone get diagnosed with COVID-19 and for the prevention measures of the COVID-19. And we must keep updated about the current diagnosis of COVID-19 because it is an evolving evolving knowledge. Because So we must keep reading and keep updated. And we know from the Dr. Gourmet's lecture that bronco alveolar lavage 
is the most diagnostic tools for the COVID-19, but not, not often used, only in critically severe patients. And we can see that there is outpatient and inpatient criteria of the COVID-19 patients, which is for outpatient criteria, we, we do not have to use aggressive medications toward the patients. And for the inpatients, we can do something to list their severe and critical symptoms. And we know that there are many antiviral which is developed and we know that Favipiravir has shown superior effects as the antiviral of choice of COVID-19. However, it is not, is it not decided yet? And then the study is still evolving. And we know that there is uh, many methods that could list the COVID-19 symptoms such as doing a prone positions and do, giving corticosteroid and then the anticoagulant based on the symptoms and then the clinical findings. Therefore, managing the patients according to the laboratory findings and clinical findings is very important to, to decide which medications is suitable for the every patients because the medication of the COVID-19 is patient tailored. So it's tailored for each patient's different medications. And for the correct medication, we must do a clear anamnesis, physical examinations and supportive examinations. And another non-medication non -medication measure such as sleep and hot water and vitamin supplementations is very important also. And don't forget that we can do CPR for critically ill patients, especially in prone positions. And we also must keep updated about the current information about the COVID-19. I think that's all for today. I would like to say thank you for all participants joining and hope you have a nice day and see you tomorrow. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you, Gurbilash, sir. Thank you. Good to see you.